Sean McGinnis um, is going to be discussing uh, the management of hypernatremia um, in adults. So Dr. McGinnis. Something that comes up frequently in the ICU and um, overnight when we're taking care of these patients, it causes a lot of anxiety. So I wanted to further investigate. Um, the data on this goes back into the 40s and 50s, um, associating correction rates of sodium um, with uh, neurologic outcomes. Um, this was a paper from 1939, one of the earliest ones I could find. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of data going way back in time. Um, the original article published by Dr. Edelman um, in 1958, he's the one that actually created a linear regression as far as um, changes in sodium, potassium, and total body water. Um, and this equation is still used today when applying um, our cor correction rates. So who develops hypernatremia? It's often those with impaired thirst or access to water. And that's often those with altered mental status, intubated patients, infants, and elderly. As far as the incidence rates, uh, the table in the bottom right shows a study on um, patients in the ICU. Um, between 6 and 26 percent of patients within the ICU develop hypernatremia during their course of treatment. And as far as non-critically ill patients, it's between 0.2 and 1 percent of patients. So this is fairly common and it does happen. The pathophysiology, again, goes back to Edelman's original equation, and it's either due to a gain of sodium or a loss of free water. Sodium gain is usually done by us with administration of hypertonic solutions. Um, there are several sorts of uh, sodium-rich antibiotics that I've included on the right. And then renal water loss is often from osmotic diuresis due to hyperglycemia, giving patients diabetics, patients with diabetes insipidus, and then finally extra renal lo water loss. This is insensible losses that can account for up to 980 milliliters in a day in a 70 kilogram person. The presence of fever alone can cause an additional 3.5 mils per kilogram per day for every increase in one degree Celsius. And then things such as diarrhea, NG suction, or fluid losses via tubes or drains. This is an image we probably all recall from um, studies back in medical school. And really it's uh, hypernatremia creates this hypertonicity and that creates a shift of free water from intracellular to extracellular space, thus cerebral edema and seizures and neurologic complications. What I want to touch on is the concept of organic osmolites. Um, these are small intracellular molecules such as glutamate, taurine, or myoinocytal. And this is kind of the, the idea of acute versus chronic hypernatremia. In the acute setting, you initially have a shift of water and electrolytes. And that maintains cellular volume over a period of minutes to hours. However, on the verge of one to two days is when this chronic um, picture takes place, which is a shift of these osmolites. So in cases of hypotonicity, these osmolites will shift from the cells um, out of the cell to maintain cellular volume. At the same time, there's regulation of these osmolite accumulating transporters. So over days of hypernatremia, this cerebral adaptation has occurred, and these osmolites have shifted into the cells. At this point in time, rapid lowering of sodium can lead to further shift of water into the cells and thus cerebral edema. But again, this is all physiology-based evidence. This was an image explaining this process. Um, initially, you have a normal cell volume, which then undergoes a state of hypertonicity. Within minutes is the shift of water and electrolytes. Uh, over a period of days, you have this cerebral adaptation where um, gene transcription of these osmolite uh, pathways is occurring, and it allows shift of osmolites. And at this point in time is when, uh, theoretically, cerebral edema can occur. So why is cerebral edema more common in neonates than adults? Really all convincing studies that we have in this point in time are done in neonates. And the reason being, human brain volume rapidly increases during the first six years of life. In adults, it reduces from the age 45 to its lowest volume at age 86. So neonates are more prone to neurologic complications due to change in brain volume as they have le less room within the school. So where do we get the recommendation of less than 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour or less than 10 in 24 hours? This is the main article from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, and it was written by Dr. Adroge and Dr. Matias. These two have actually developed another form of that original equation I showed you that we actually use today. <clears throat> Within their article, they state, in such patients reducing the serum sodium concentration at a maximal rate of 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour 
prevent cerebral edema and convulsions. Thus, we recommend a fall of uh, no more than 10 millimoles per liter per day. But when you really pull their sources, they're quoting studies from the 70s. And uh, this was a study of, I believe, 18 infants, or sorry, this was 47 infants with hypernatremic dehydration where they gave fluids and found some of them had convulsions. Their second study is the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology. This was 18 infants, again, with hypernatremic dehydration where they gave fluids and assumed less than 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour would be safe. This journal is from, or article is from the New England Journal, again, from 2015. This paper is written by Dr. Richard Stearns, who's really the father of all of the literature out there on hypernatremia. He's written an article on up to date. He's published in the Journal of Nephrology. He's really the main guy on this topic. Again, he states in his article, limiting correction rates so that plasma sodium is decreased by less than 0.5 per liter per hour reduces the risk of cerebral edema. However, fear of these complications, which have been reported only in young children, should not deter the aggressive rehydration of adults with acute hypernatremia to avoid brain hemorrhage or osmotic demyelination. Going back to his first statement, again, he's referencing a neonate study from 2013 of 4,280 neonates. So again, all the studies that are being published are, are on children. There's no adult studies. And then uh, uh, interestingly, he cites another article from Journal of Critical Care, um, Survival of Acute Hypernatremia Due to Massive Soy Sauce Ingestion. <laughs> interestingly, this pops up all over the literature as well, um, and I'll touch on that at the very end. Um, final is Journal of Critical Care, where they discuss the topic, and they also state the phrase, in the case of chronic hypernatremia, compensatory mechanisms have already begun, that's those osmolites that I spoke about, and too rapid correction may result in cerebral edema, which can lead to herniation or death. What article do they cite? That original New England Journal article from 2000. And they actually go on to say, um, these data suggest that the maximum rate of correction should not exceed 0.5 per hour, often accounts for the often postulated correction of 12 per day. This is going back to up to date, same uh, author, Dr. Richard Stearns, that I mentioned previously. He makes the same statement and goes on to say, in theory, the same principles apply to adults as what they found in children. So the New England Journal article on the far right, they do discuss limit of correction and management of overcorrection. In minutes to hours, they say excessive correction is not known to be harmful. Same statement in uh, one to two days, and then they only make this reference to children. So, however, fear of these complications, with ha which have only been reported in young children, should not deter the aggressive rehydration of adults with acute hypernatremia to avoid brain hemorrhage or osmotic demyelination. And then th this article states, in contrast to hyponatremia, there is little risk of overcorrection in patients with hypernatremia, and adults with hypernatremia are often undertreated. Same article, correction rates, again, have not been evaluated in prospective studies. However, to clarify this issue, we do need randomized controlled trials, which is difficult in an ethical point of view. So here's the main study I want to talk about. This was published April 4th, 2019, hot off the press. Um, this is a journal of nephrology on correction rates and health outcomes in critically ill patients. Their objective was to assess so the association of hypernatremia rates with neurologic outcomes, and it was a retrospective cohort study. They included patients greater than 18 years old with hypernatremia on admission, which was 122 patients, versus hospital acquired, 327. And they compared inpatient mortality with 30-day mortality in different rates, so greater than 5 per hour, and then greater than 8, 10, and 12 in 24 hours. Here's some of their findings. So they've divided this chart into admission hypernatremia on the left and hospital acquired hypernatremia on the right. The first uh, red line you see there is the sodium correction rates at 24 hours. So in the first group, um, it was a change of 7.5. The other group was 13, and that was significant. And then in the hospital acquired hypernatremia, they changed it by 5 in 24 hours versus 13 in 24 hours. And then as far as the rates, if you look at the second red line, um, it was 0.4 versus 0.7 and 0.3 versus 0.9. And then they looked at mortality rates between these two groups. So the top half is hypernatremia on admission, and they've divided the three by less than or greater than eight, 10, or 12. 
So in the top left, looking at greater than or less than eight, there was actually decreased mortality with more rapid correction, so faster than eight. So by correcting by less than eight actually showed significantly increased mortality rates. The rest of the numbers did not reach uh, statistical significance, but there was a trend towards lower mortality rates with faster correction. Um, the bottom half is hospital acquired hypernatremia. Again, no s statistical significance, but a trend towards lower mortality with correcting faster. This was 30 day mortality rates. Again, no significance between fast versus slow correction. So, like I said, their outcomes were no difference in in hospital mortality with correcting greater than five in hospital acquired or admission. No difference in adjusted odds ratio of mortality for, for rapid versus slow correction. And they also said there was not a single case of cerebral edema attributable to rapid hypernatremia correction, including 122 cases on admission, 128 cases of hospital acquired, and an additional 28 patients with ICD-9 codes. And then no difference in 30-day uh, mortality estimates. So in conclusion, there's neg negligible data to support the widely used correction rate of 0.5 per hour with a maximum of 10 millimoles per liter per day in the adult population. With acute hypernatremia, I believe it's safe to, to lower rates, lower sodium rapidly within the first 24 hours. As far as chronic hypernatremia, in theory, yes, there is risk for cerebral edema. Studies in adults have yet to show really what rate we can safely do this. Um, if it were me, I would aim for at least going by 12 and 24 hours as going a little bit slower than that has shown increased mortality, but really any faster than that is unclear at this time. Um, I did run into Dr. DeLeo and discuss this with him. His quote was in the 15 years he's been doing this practice, he's seen maybe two cases of this. <clears throat> so it is very rare. Um, so most large studies show excess caution on rate of correction, resulting in under correction of serum sodium and ultimately higher mortality rates. Sodium should be checked frequently with adjustment in fluid infusion rates to ensure adequate correction. And this was the case of the extreme I want to touch on to finish. Um, this was a 19-year-old male. And oddly enough, every paper cites this case, so it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, he had ingested a quart of soy sauce due to a challenge by his friends. So it's a 170-gram load of salt. It's the highest reported sodium level, 196, in an adult to survive an ingestion neurologically intact. On arrival, his GCS was three and he was intubated. His sodium peaked at 196, about 4.5 hours after ingestion. He received six liters of free water over 30 minutes with an additional 5.2 liters over 24 hours. His sodium normalized to 145. He was extubated at 26 hours, mild confusion day two, normal mental status day three, and he was discharged day four. So just out of curiosity in our resident classroom, we have our wall of fame. So if anyone was wondering what our record is at the moment, 179, and I believe the 186 might be a corrected version. Um, I don't know if any of us here saw this patient or not, but that's currently our record. And there's my resources. Comments. Uh, Thaddeus Bordowski from Santa Barbara. Um, in, in that most recent study uh, that you talked about, where patients whose uh, sodium corrected quickly had reduced mortality, did they receive different amounts of fluids? Or did, or did they, you know, for that variable, like patients who had ongoing diarrhea may have been sicker and their sodium uh, wouldn't correct with the usual uh, treatment? Often we have hypernatremia and they get some D5W, but the sodium is the same the next day and it may just delay in patients with ongoing fluid losses. Did they look at the difference in the amount of free water they received? I don't recall the type of fluids they used. Um, what they did do is try to correct for um, other medical issues that they had using Apache scores to try to eliminate um, mortality rates of other reasons. So I don't know what kind of fluids they did use though. Um, I do want to mention currently the SALSA trial is underway in Korea. It is the first randomized controlled trial in correction rates of sodium. It has not been done before. It was started in 2017, so it should be out shortly, and that might be another Mythbusters in the future. That was great. Um, so the difference, people who 
who presented with acute hyperinsulinemia, or not acute, but from the outside world to the hospital, and got rapidly corrected and had a better survival rate if they were corrected quickly, versus the ones who developed hyperinsulinemia in the hospital didn't seem to show that. And is that how I interpret that? Because it seems like um, that might suggest that it's safer to be outside the hospital. <laughs> well, I think what they were, <laughs> yeah. Um, What's interesting is this is basically saying acute versus chronic. If it's developed in the hospital, it's acute hyponatremia because we've seen it happen. If the hyponatremic on admission, it's chronic. We would think chronic hyponatremia is more dangerous because correcting it rapidly can lead to cerebral edema. In this study, the hyponatremia on admission in less than or greater than eight was the only one that reached significance. So it's interesting that a chronic case had better improved mortality with factor correction. I wouldn't have thought it would be the other way around. Um, but maybe it, yeah, I don't know. Well, in no case, it seemed like correcting it rapidly, did they do worse, at least inpatient versus outpatient. So um, it doesn't seem like it's dangerous, at, at least, and it may actually be beneficial to correct it more rapidly, is, what it, is it the way I interpret it. I don't know. You guys ready to vote? So is it a myth? Hypernatremia in adults should not be corrected more than 0.5 millimoles per hour or 10 millimoles in 24 hours to prevent cerebral edema. So how many think that uh, this statement is, is true, that uh, we shouldn't correct it any faster than 0.5 or 10 in 24 hours? How many think it's plausible? How many think that this is busted? All right, 